I will perform transorbital lobotomy on 10 patients within an hour. In the annals of medical history, mental illness has been a terrifying mystery. Desperate for a cure, doctors ventured into the unknown, the human brain. Their solution was harsh and cruel. This is about a surgery called lobotomy, created in the late 19th century. Lobotomy gets some home. It offered hope, but often led to sadness. But at what cost? Was a lobotomy really an answer for a young woman like Rosemary Kennedy, sister of former President John F. Kennedy? She did eventually regain her ability to walk and talk, but she lost a lot of what was in her personality. It should have been a terrible setback for lobotomy. Come with us as we explore the sad history of lobotomy from its angry beginnings to its poisonous result. We will traverse the science, ethics, and actual human tales of this medical horror and analyze why what one time was a celebrated medical procedure is now seen as the darkest chapter in medical history. There was a number of children who received lobotomies at Freeman's hands. He recommended lobotomy for a young boy who was having trouble in his family getting along with a stepmother. Introduction. Lobotomy, also known as leucotomy, was a surgical procedure developed for psychiatric or neurological disorders. It involved severing the connections in the brain's prefrontal cortex, often using a sharp instrument inserted through the eye sockets or holes drilled into the skull. Initially hailed as a miracle cure for mental illness in some countries, lobotomy quickly gained popularity in the medical community. Brief history. In the late 1880s, Swiss physician Gottlieb Burkhardt first noticed that removing parts of the brain cortex could calm patients. He operated on six patients, not aiming to cure them, but to make them calmer. While one patient died and another later committed suicide, unclear if related to surgery, some patients did become easier to manage. Burkhardt was influenced by German physiologist Friedrich Goltz's experiments on dogs, where brain tissue removal altered behavior. However, surgical brain disruption in humans was rare for decades after Burkhardt. In 1935, American neuroscientists Carlisle F. Jacobson and John Fulton showed that removing parts of the frontal lobe in chimpanzees could alter behavior, calming one and agitating another. The same year, Portuguese neurophysician Antonio Egas Moniz tried a similar approach on a human, drilling holes in the skull and injecting alcohol into the brain's frontal cortex to disrupt certain nerve pathways. The first surgery was performed in 1935 on a patient with severe agitation and hallucinations. It seemed successful, reducing severe paranoia and anxiety. Moniz quickly shared his findings through articles and a monograph in 1936, but initially, the medical community was a skeptical of the new procedure. In July 1936, at a meeting in Paris, one of Moniz's assistants presented results on patients who had undergone the procedure, but some attendees criticized it. Sobral Cid, who provided the first set of patients, claimed they returned diminished and with a degradation of personality. Another psychiatrist, Paul Corbin, questioned a surgical technique based more on theory than clinical evidence. Despite this, reports of successful surgeries led to the experimental adoption of the procedure in countries like Brazil, Cuba, Italy, Romania, and the United States. Moniz and surgeon Pedro Almeida Lima performed this on about 40 patients by 1937, with mixed results. Moniz created a tool called a leucotome, to disrupt nerve fibers, and the surgery became popular due to a lack of alternatives for calming, agitated, delusional, or violent patients. Italian neuropsychiatrists, however, were early adopters and performed hundreds of surgeries by 1939, particularly at the Racconigi Hospital under Emilio Rizzati's direction. In 1936, American neurologists Walter J. Freeman II and James W. Watts modified Moniz's procedure, renaming it prefrontal lobotomy. They developed the Freeman-Watts standard lobotomy using a spatula-like tool. 
Antonio Egas Moniz, the originator of the procedure, shared the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 1949 for its discovery of the therapeutic value. However, the awarding of the prize has been controversial. Reasons to discover. The increased use of lobotomies was influenced by several factors. The mental health cases. Gro World War II, which lasted from 1939 to 1945, was likely the cause for the surge in the number of lobotomies done to patients with mental disorders, from PTSD and depression, to those for both military personnel and citizens. As per the Wall Street Journal, World War II witnessed an estimated 2,000 mentally ill veterans who received the treatment. Search for quick fixes. The urgency of treating a large number of patients with limited resources may have contributed to the popularity of lobotomies. They were seen as a relatively quick and simple surgery compared to other available treatments. Societal perceptions and stigmatization. Lobotomy was seen as the best cure for rebellious daughters as society viewed fiery tempers in young women as inappropriate. LGBTQ plus individuals were once diagnosed with attachment disorders, leading doctors to believe that stresses like electric shocks or skull drilling could modify their behavior towards heterosexuality and recovery. Lobotomy might be in sort of a simplistic way. Evil doctors experimenting on patients and creating all this havoc and disruption. Initial purpose. The initial purpose of lobotomy was to help grossly disturbed patients with schizophrenia, manic depression, and mania, bipolar disorder, and other mental illnesses. The procedure was seen as a radical therapeutic measure. It was believed that surgical manipulation of the brain could be beneficial in modifying human behavior. Some patients seemed to improve after the procedure, but many also suffered severe and irreparable brain damage. The role of Dr. Walter Freeman and Dr. James Watts. Initially perceived as paradoxical, lobotomy allowed those with mental disorders to avoid institutionalization thanks, in large part, to the efforts of Dr. Walter Freeman and Dr. James Watts in the United States. Freeman, a neurologist, and Watts, a neurosurgeon, developed the transorbital lobotomy, a procedure that involved placing an orbitoclast an instrument resembling an ice pick, under the eyelid and against the top of the eye socket. A mallet was then used to drive the orbitoclast through the thin layer of bone and into the brain. Freeman's marketing tactics expanded the range of diseases lobotomy was believed to cure, attracting more clients. Even his experimental approach could have landed him a job as marketer for one of the streaming services nowadays. Dr. Walter Freeman and Dr. James Watts, who was a neurosurgeon, were claiming that they had great success, that they were restoring a good life to people who had been suffering, and they had become famous. One of Freeman's many gifts, skills, was cultivating the media, and they reciprocated with a lot of very favorable coverage. The capacity of Freeman to make people realize that lobotomy could do them well brought about its acceptance by many portraying the kind of power that marketing had even with controversial actions. Miracle cure to the brain. Cutting the brain cures the soul. The media was all over it. Dr. Walter Freeman was a busy man on the operating table, performing more than 3,000 lobotomies during his years of practice, oftentimes without patients being provided with any anesthesia. Although the ice pick-like instrument used under no anesthesia made the appearance of lobotomy seem very scary. It instantly changed the violent patient's submissiveness, the rise of lobotomy. By the early 1940s and 1950s, lobotomy had gained popularity, with approximately 20,000 procedures performed in the United States alone by 1951, and a substantial number conducted in the United Kingdom as well. The most significant aspect of lobotomy patient demographics was the over-representation of certain groups, which were mainly gay men. And the reasons for this are not entirely clear, and they say that the societal prejudices and preconceptions about homosexuality might have been a cause of the increased probability of gay men being made to go through lobotomy. Back in those days, 
being a homosexual was commonly seen as a mental condition, and as a result, people sought psychiatric care or even lobotomy. Additionally, women underwent lobotomy procedures at a significantly higher rate than men during this period. Studies indicate that nearly 60% of lobotomy patients in the United States and 74% in Ontario, Canada from 1948 to 1952 were female. Several factors likely contributed to this gender disparity, including societal attitudes toward women's mental health, as well as the perception of women as being more prone to emotional instability or hysteria. Variations. There were other variations of the lobotomy operation, such as the prefrontal lobotomy, which targeted the connections through the eye sockets without drilling, and the orbital lobotomy, which targeted the frontal lobes by drilling holes into the skull. The procedure. Due to various approaches to brain surgery, the most common method was the transorbital lobotomy, also known as the ice pick lobotomy, developed by Dr. Walter Freeman and Dr. James Watts. Here is a detailed explanation of how the procedure was typically carried out. Implementation. Before the lobotomy took place, the patient was typically provided with a calming sedation or anesthetic to minimize the pain and uneasiness. Moreover, because procedures were very finicky, any rapid movements on the patient's parts could potentially interfere with an operation. Incision. Through a small incision of about one inch length made slightly above the patient's eyeball, near to the tear duct. This cut gave direct access into the area in which the instrument used to perform the lobotomy would be inserted. Insertion of the lobotomizing instrument. The instrument was a surgical tool, which looked ice pick. It was then inserted and tapped softly along the thin layer of bone at the back of the eye socket. The tool was aimed at cutting the fiber optic cables in the frontal lobe of the brain. This process needed accuracy to avoid vandalizing nearby structures by mistake. Severing connections. Now the apparatus was in place, it was turned left and right in order for the section frontal lobe to be separated from the rest of the brain. This was thought to disturb the pathways that the brain networks use to link certain diseases to the mind. Repeat for other side. In some cases, the procedure was performed on both sides of the brain to achieve a more symmetrical effect. This fact thus implied that the exact procedures would have to be repeated on the other side of the brain of the patient. Closure. Then, the frontal lobe connections were disconnected and the cutting tool was meticulously removed. The wound was closed using stitches or adhesive strips after the incision. Subsequently, the wound was put on a bandage, which ensured that it was adequately protected during the healing process. Effects on patients. The intended effect of a lobotomy was to reduce tension or agitation, and many early patients did exhibit those changes. Some patients experienced a reduction in symptoms and reported feeling more calm and less anxious. However, many patients also experienced serious side effects, including personality changes, emotional blunting, intellectual impairment, and in some cases, a complete loss of cognitive function. One of the most notable cases is that of Rosemary Kennedy, the sister of US President John F. Kennedy and Senators Robert F. and Ted Kennedy. She was born on September 13, 1918, and was the third child and first daughter of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. During her birth, the doctor was not immediately available because of an outbreak of the Spanish influenza epidemic, and the nurse ordered Rose Kennedy to keep her legs closed, forcing the baby's head to stay in the birth canal for two hours. The action resulted in a harmful loss of oxygen. As Rosemary began to grow, her parents noticed she was not reaching the basic developmental steps a human normally reaches at a certain month or year. Rosemary was slower to walk and talk. As she grew, it became more and more obvious that Rosemary could not really move beyond, say, a third or fourth grade educational level. In her early young adult years, Rosemary Kennedy experienced seizures and violent mood swings. After learning this, her father arranged a lobotomy surgery performed on her in 1941 at the age of 23 years. The operation of a lobotomy was done by Dr. James W. Watts and Walter Freeman, who cut the linkages in the frontal lobe of brain. 
The process paralyzed her completely and made her speech incoherent. After the lobotomy, everything changed for the worse in Rosemary's life. She was rendered a virtual invalid. She lost her ability to walk or talk. They cut too deeply into the brain fibers and Rosemary became disabled. She did eventually regain her ability to walk and talk, but she lost a lot of what was in her personality. It should have been a terrible setback for lobotomy. She became a different person from that moment, and her disability was physical. She remained at St. Coletta, an institute in Jefferson, Wisconsin, receiving daily care until she died. Her true past and whereabouts remained secret, and that fact was concealed for more than half a century. At first, she was cut off from her siblings and other members of her family due to the lobotomy, but she did make trips to see them during her later life. Many people who underwent lobotomies experienced severe side effects and complications, such as chronic headaches, seizures, intracranial hemorrhages, bleeding inside the skull, dementia, a condition that causes memory decline and personality changes, brain abscesses, and even death. A real-life example is the case of Howard Dully, who is one of the youngest survivors of the transorbital lobotomy, a procedure performed on him when he was just 12 years old. Born on November 30th, 1948 in Oakland, California, Dully had a difficult childhood. His mother died of cancer when he was five, and his father later remarried. His stepmother found Dully's natural ebullience and physical strength almost impossible to control. In 1960, Dully's father and stepmother took him to see Dr. Walter Freeman, a neurologist who had diagnosed Dully as suffering from childhood schizophrenia since age four. Despite numerous other medical and psychiatric professionals who had seen Dully did not detect a psychiatric disorder and instead blamed poor parenting by his stepmother. Freeman performed a transorbital lobotomy on Dully for $200, equivalent to $2,060 in 2023. During the procedure, a long, sharp instrument called an orbitoclast was inserted through each of Dully's eye sockets seven centimeters into his brain. After the procedure, Dully's life took a turn for the worse. He was institutionalized for years as a juvenile, I just was a kid that had no place to go, is what they kept telling me. Right. We have no place to send you. And then I went back to juvenile hall, back on the streets, got in trouble because I didn't have any skills or know how to live. Transferred to a school for children with behavior-related problems, incarcerated, and was eventually homeless and an alcoholic. However, Dully managed to turn his life around. After becoming sober and getting a college degree in computer information systems, he became a California state certified behind the wheel instructor for a school bus company in San Jose, California. In his 50s, with the assistance of national public radio producer David Isay, Dully started to research what had happened to him as a child. He traveled the country with Isay and Pia Kocha, speaking with members of his family, relatives of other lobotomy patients, and relatives of Freeman, and also gaining access to Freeman's archives. Dully first relayed his story on a national public radio broadcast in 2005, prior to co-authoring a memoir published in 2007. Controversies and criticisms. Lobotomy was much contender that brought forth a lot of ethical concerns to the medical field, activists, and members of the general public. Some of the key controversies and criticisms include informed consent. Informed consent is one of the major ethical concerns that arose about lobotomies. Patients were not fully informed of the risks. Some underwent the procedure, while others were forced to do it without consent against their will. Overuse and misuse. Critics objected that lobotomy had been used too often and employed where better therapy existed. On the other hand, the fear prevailed among many that the procedure was often employed as a method of controlling or punishing the mentally ill rather than treating the underlying condition. Lack of evidence. Besides being used commonly, there was a deficiency of scientific proof to show the efficiency of the said technique. Some complained the treatment was based on mistaken conceptions about the true nature of the mental illness. Therefore, more scientific knowledge was required to verify the process's long-term effects. Side effects and complications. The process of lobotomy was connected with a palate 
of serious side effects and complications, which resulted in changes in personality, cognitive impairment, seizures, and even death in some cases. Some experts contend that these risks eclipse any positive outcome from it. Human rights. The activists of human rights campaigned against lobotomy as an infringement on patients' rights, including the right to individuality and the prohibition of cruel, degrading, or humiliating treatment. The fallout. The main reason why lobotomy disappeared as a treatment that was commonly applied is that of many reasons. Rise of safer medications. Through the introduction of psychiatric drugs in the 1950s and 1960s, like antipsychotics and antidepressants, a safer and more targeted method of endeavoring to treat mental illness became available. These drugs gave patients the freedom to avoid the difficult transformations of their personalities and the mental deterioration caused by lobotomy. Growing ethical concerns. As the negative effects of lobotomy became more apparent, ethical concerns grew within the medical community. The lack of informed consent, the targeting of minorities and women, and the overall invasiveness of the procedure were heavily criticized. Questionable effectiveness. Long-term studies on lobotomized patients revealed minimal to inconsistent positive effects. Many patients experienced a flattening of personality along with the desired reduction in symptoms. This lack of clear benefit further undermined the procedure's credibility. Public outcry. News of lobotomies, negative outcomes, and Freeman's aggressive tactics reached the public, leading to growing outrage. Sensationalized media portrayals and personal stories of lobotomized individuals fueled public disapproval. Legacy and controversy. The legacy of lobotomy on mental health treatment is complex. On one hand, lobotomy was a pioneering procedure that led to advancements in our understanding of the brain and its functions. It also helped pave the way for modern psychosurgery techniques, which are used in rare cases today to treat severe mental disorders. On the other hand, lobotomy has a dark legacy due to its often irreversible and damaging effects on patients. Many patients who underwent lobotomy experienced a loss of personality and emotional depth. Some patients' symptoms improved to the point where they could be discharged from the hospital, while others became more outspoken and experienced mood swings. Representations in literature and film. Literature and film have often portrayed lobotomy as a brutal and dehumanizing procedure, reflecting and sometimes shaping societal attitudes. In Robert Penn Warren's novel, All the King's Men, a lobotomy is described as a crude form of surgery, suggesting the surgeon's inability to bring about change through compassion. Tennessee Williams' play, Suddenly, Last Summer, criticizes lobotomy. There's only one little operation they perform here. It's on the brain. It's called a lobotomy. Particularly when used on homosexuals, highlighting the procedure's use to enforce conformity. Ken Kesey's novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, depicts lobotomy as a form of punishment and control, reducing individuals to empty shells. These portrayals, among others, have contributed to a negative perception of lobotomy in popular culture. Aftermath. Freeman remained silent about many aspects of his advertising campaign. The barbaric procedure resulted in the deaths of at least 490 individuals and left thousands more in a vegetative state. They lost the ability to interact with the outside world or even recognize themselves. Many patients faced a grim fate. Sent back to asylums, they grappled with disabilities caused by irreversible brain damage. It wasn't until 1967 that lobotomy was finally banned, acknowledging its failure to transform patients into docile individuals. Today, psychological therapy offers a more humane approach to mental health treatment. Short tempers and sexual orientations are no longer stigmatized. Calls to revoke Moniz's Nobel Prize for developing lobotomy persist, though no action has been taken. One wonders what might have transpired had the procedure not been banned. In modern times, who might be considered candidates for lobotomy? What conditions could be treated with such a procedure? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for joining us.
We hope you found it informative and thought-provoking.